Good morning, team. Chemistry coach coming at you on another awesome day. We are in our journey on mathematical use in chemistry, right? It's, uh, I find it every single semester for over two decades now. Students come in, you know, sharp in mathematics going, hey, I got this, got this. But you're trained to think differently in a math class on how to approach a problem than you are in a chemistry class because we have to, as chemists, not only worry about the math, right, getting to the right answer when we're doing calculations, we need to track the units, so you slap a unit on the math, so that complicates it, and we're the ones that joyfully have to track uncertainty, because when you make measurements in the laboratory, those are uncertain values, right? And if you do calculation using those measurements or any value that has some uncertainty to it, your answer will also be uncertain. So our ultimate goal is to be able to track the value in our calculation, the uncertainty in our calculation, and the units. And I look, when I'm grading things, I look at the final answer. I go, is the number right? Is the uncertainty correct? And it doesn't have the right number of significant digits or something like that. And then uh, does it have the correct units? And I want to see in the calculation how that transpired. So you don't just throw an answer on there and I don't see how your work happened. How'd you get there? How'd you get from point A to point B? I want to know, I want to see how those units panned out. I want to see if, if you have three significant digits in your answer, I can see why from your calculations. Right? That's going to be important. We got to be crystal clear as a chemist. So ultimately, we're going to be after how do we track uncertainty in calculations, but we can't do that unless we know the uncertainty and all the values going into the calculation. Thus, Counting significant figures or significant digits. I want to look at that number that's maybe it's provided on a quiz or on an exam or uh, maybe it's something you measured in a lab, right? Or it's a calculated value or it's a constant that was provided for you, maybe a conversion factor. We need to be able to look at that number and go, hey, this is the uncertainty of that specific number that was provided. And so we do that by counting the number of significant figures. So hopefully this is just a review for you, but let's go through the thinking process and how to do that. So the first thing you want to ask yourself, plop, you're on a quiz. Here's a number. Is that number exact or is it not exact? Right? So we'll take some time to look at exact numbers. In essence, an exact number has no uncertainty to it. It's a defined value. So we'll talk about different types of defined values. And hopefully that's clarified when you're taking a quiz or exam. Uh, and if you look on my, you probably hopefully printed this out, exact conversion factor. So if you go to my website, you can print that out. So what I did is I pulled out for different types of, you know, volume, temperature, mass, energy, the conversions factors between English and metric units that are actually exact. And I got the metric conversions. So metric conversions are all exact. There's no uncertainty because they're defined values. All right. So let's go through exact numbers on the next board, and then we'll do um, one, uh, numbers that are not exact, which is what you'll spend most of your time with. First and foremost... Let's look at these exact numbers. And as you do this more, you know, you get experience and stuff, you, you start to recognize things. But exact, exact numbers have no uncertainty. So you can think of them ha of has, of having unlimited or an infinite number of significant digits. So they're never going to limit any calculations. You don't even worry about them when you're doing a calculation. As far as tracking a certain, you just ignore. I mean, obviously, they're part of the calculation, but you don't even worry about them when you're doing uh, the uncertainty and tracking it through. So what are we looking for? How do you know something's going to be exact? Usually it's specified for you, but a lot of conversion factors. And I try to get you guys to use, if you can, exact conversion factors so you don't have to worry about that particular value. So again, any metric conversions by definition are exact, right? 1,000 meters in a kilometer, 100 centimeters in a meter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I showed this already. So if you have access to my website, you can print this out. You can find these pretty much anywhere. So here's just some common metric conversions. It's not all of them. There's some really whacked out ones. You know that uh, when we looked at temperature, 9 degrees Fahrenheit for every 5 degrees Celsius, that was uh, defined based on the freezing point and boiling point of water difference. Um, here's English to metric and like pounds to grams, those kinds of things, 2.54 centimeters per inch. Those are all defined and exact. So preferably you will use those when you're doing any kind of unit line equation or dimensional analysis. Um, so lots of those babies. And so that's probably going to be mostly where you use exact values is in the, the choice of conversion factors that you use. 
right? Some constants, uh, and I will let you know on my quizzes and exams if I give you a constant, whether that's an exact number or not. Usually it's a moot point, because even if it's not exact, um, the number of significant digits, like the, you know, Avogadro's constant, speed of light, all these kinds of things. We're going to give you so many, uh, you know, digits in there. And usually we'll truncate it off because I don't want to give you, you know, 15 decimal places or something. That's just, you know, we don't need all that. So usually we'll chop it off to four or five or six significant digits. Um, so we're going to treat it as a not exact number, but it's got so many significant digits. Uh, it's not going to limit your calculations. But I'll let you know whether it's exact or not when we do it. Uh, another time you'll run into oh, reference values. We'll hit that in a little bit later when we look at things like atomic mass. Um, all the atomic masses on our periodic table are, are relative to a defined value. We're going to see that's a specific type of isotope of carbon called the carbon-12 isotope, which we define as a specific value. So that is an exact number. But all the other ones are calculated uh, based on that, so those are not exact. So you'll, you'll see some reference values that are defined. We define this and calculate everything else referenced to that. You know, that's a common theme in chemistry. All right. Another thing that's more of a gray area is when you're counting objects, right? I could go through my house right now, find all my pets, right? At uh, one time we had six cats. We're down to four. We went down to three and then we're up to four again. It's like we're big animal goofballs. We, we got a bearded dragon. We got a conure, dog, birds. I mean, it's like, ah, I just spent like an hour and a half just feeding animals today. This is crazy. But I can count all those. I, I can, oh, I, there's my six cats, right? I can go through and see one, two, three, four, four kids. There's four kids. Three are girls. One's a boy in my house. Yay. Okay. So those, I, I, there's no uncertainty in that. I can see right now, I have one calculator in my hand. Are you sure it's not 1.2, maybe 3? No, it's 1! Everybody would agree, unless you you just, you know, got done with a really bad party and you're, you know, oh, I see two of them. It's pretty obvious. Um, so when you're, you know, 12 apples, a number of students in a class, you know, there's 20 students in this class. So you get the idea, right? I can make fun of it all I want. Now, when does counting distinct objects go from exact to not exact? Yeah, that's where the gray area is. It depends who you're talking to. I've seen, seen different people do different things. You know, I always say, hey, wait, if you got a, a gigantic barrel of M&Ms and there's 101,325 M&Ms, well, you could probably get 15 people and we're probably going to get 15 different values. So I would say that would no longer be exact. My breaking point's usually around 1,000 or so. Uh, just use your guts with that. If you're doing a calculation um, and you have a number like that and it's not uh, specified to you whether that number is exact or not, say like, you know, you know, 22,500, you know, cars or whatever it is. Um, you can, uh, if it's not defined in there, you can do that in my class, at least for me, different professors might do different things. You could say, hey, treating those objects as exact, this would be the uncertainty. Or treating that number, which is a little bit large, as not exact, this is what my answer would be. I'd be okay with that, but I try to make it as obvious as I possibly can. All right, let's look at where you spend most of your time, numbers that are not exact. Alrighty, gang. So for non-exact numbers, right? So that could be from uh, definitely any measurement, calculated values, unless all the values going into the calculation were exact, well, which would be pretty rare, unless it's all pure metric. Um, it depends the significance of each digit. You have to look at every single digit in that value and go, is that a significant digit or is it not? There, and once we know that, then we can count them. And once we know how many significant digits are in each value, then we can do calculations. So there's a a distinct linear pathway here to figuring out uncertainty. All right, we're going to break this down into whether that's a non-zero digit or a zero digit. So we, we're zeros are the tricky part. Non-zeros are easy. Ones and fives and nines, those are a piece of cake. Because if it's in there, it's significant, right? Unless otherwise specified. Right. Sometimes we'll do calculations and carry non-significant digits. Uh, we like to use a vertical dashed line with that. Some people use a bar above it. But we're, let's just say we're not adding uh, any of that. Give you a number. Boom. If it's on a quiz or test and we know it's not an exact number, anything that's not a zero, you are going to count as significant. Right? So, for example, let's say we're on a quiz and you have to do something with 325.2 miles. Well, you can see from that unit, that's a length measurement. Right, 4.12 grams. You can see from that unit that that's a measurement. All right, but if I had put uh, 41, um, there's 80 
trillion billion different nouns I could put. I can't even think of one, right? <laughs> 41 lamps, right? I could count those, right? So you could see from the unit that that would be an exact. That's counting a small number of distinct objects. But you can see miles length, grams, that's a mass measurement. So anything, there's no zero, so I'm going to count everything. One, two, three, four. So that would be four significant figures. SF is fine. Or you could say significant digits or sig figs. Usually you'll see SF. So like on a test, if you get the number right, but you get the sig figs wrong, I'll, I'll check it off. Uh, nine out of 10 minus one SF. You're like, ah, I screwed up the uncertainty. Darn it. So here, the four counts, the one counts, the two counts. So that would be three. That's the easy part. Zeros are where it's a pain in the butt. All right, let's do zero. Here we go. So what if it's not a zero? So it's either a zero or not a zero. If it's not a zero, it counts, right? So if it is a zero, the significance depends on where that zero is referenced to the non-zero digit. So there's really only three places. So zeros can be before any non-zero digits, like 0 0.55, right? Or it could be in between two non-zero digits, like 304, 304, right? Whatever the units are. So the, uh, those are called, so the, if it's before, it's a leading zero. If it's in between, it's a captured or a captive zero. Or the zero could come after the last non-zero digit, like 3040, 3040, right? Or 402.0. Those are uh, called trailing zeros. So let's look at each one uh, in turn because the significance depends on that. Hey, right. let's look at leading zeros first. That's the first one I mentioned. So that's any zero that comes before, right? So this is before the first non-zero digit. All of them, right? So you look for the first non-zero digit, any zero before that, those are leading zeros. They're never significant ever. They're just decimal place pushers. Right? We need them to get the correct magnitude, yet retain the correct uncertainty. Examples being 0 0.0056 liters or 0 0.2157 kilometers. So let's take a look and count the number of significant uh, figures or significant digits for these. If I look at this, I know the 5 and the 6 count, so that's at least 2. Then I look at these three zeros. The decimal point doesn't matter in this case. They're all before the five. The five is the first significant digit, right? So all three of those zeros are leading zeros. None of them count. So this, only the five and six count. So this would be two significant figures, right? It's just a decimal point pusher. That's a good thing about scientific notation. We can move that over and just go 5.6 right, times 10 to the negative third liters, and we can get rid of those non-significant. So scientific notation is a great way to rewrite a number, just drop all the non-significant zeros, especially if it's a really, really small or really, really big number. So let's look at this one. The 2, 1, 5, and 7 all count. They're not zeros, so that's at least 4. That zero is before the 2, so it's a leading zero, so it doesn't count. So this would be 4 significant figures. Oh, easy peasy. Let's do captive zeros next. Here we go. Captive zeros. I think these are pretty easy as well. It's the trailing ones that cause people problems because um, leading zeros and captive zeros are black and white. They either are, they, you know, leading zeros are not. Captive zeros are significant. It's the trailing ones that are like, well, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. That's where I see the trouble come from. But you get used to this. Once you do it enough, it just becomes secondhand notation. After doing this, calculations for two, two, three weeks, 21 days usually uh, to create a new habit, you won't even think about it. You'll be doing calculations, not even in chemistry anymore, uh, throughout your life, throughout other classes in college or high school. You'll just be tracking uncertainty, counting sig figs, and not even knowing you're doing it. It's like brushing your teeth or when I had, you know, I ran a paper route when I was young. Um, so I was able to, you know, get my car at 16 and all that kind of stuff. You know, so there's a lot of times I get to the end of a block and look back and have no recollection of delivering a single newspaper. I would just look back and go, whoa, to the point where you like second guess yourself. And I'd ride my bike all the way back and check all the houses. And there was the paper right under the mat. I would lift up. I'd ride the bike up, put it under the mat, lift the mat up because it was in Washington State. It'd rain. And then I'd pop a wheelie, spin around, and go back to the next one. I took great care. Good service, huh? I, I want my 15-cent tip. But I, zero. I just, it was completely subconscious. So my goal is for you to do 
any kind of thing I introduce to you over and over and over until it becomes mentally just done in your subconscious mind. You're not even aware you're doing it. So things that might be difficult now will be subconscious and simple later, but I want you to know how to explain it to somebody. So if somebody comes up and says, hey, how did you do that? You can explain it to them logically. Here we go. Tap to zero. So they're all zeros, all of them, in between two non-zero digits. And they're always considered significant. That's part of the value. So let's say, you know, I go into a, a football throwing match with Peyton Manning, my favorite football player or ex-football player. All right. Not that either of us could throw a football 301.1 yards, but let's say we did. <laughs> All right. Uh, or Peyton Manning chucks it 300. So we measure it out and it's 302.1 yards. He'd still be playing, <laughs> right? And then I chuck it and I throw it like, you know, 25 yards probably. I got a messed up shoulder. Well, the three, the two, and the one count, but that zero's in between the three and the two. It's captive. That's part of the measurement. So that zero counts. So that's one, two, three. That would be four significant figures. I wonder if the farthest throw Peyton Manning ever threw it. Oh, something I don't know. Well, let's say we, uh, you know, have some unknown we have to measure in a laboratory, and you it says to measure it on an analytical balance, which is good to ten thousandths of a gram, right? So the uh, uncertain digit is that last digit there. Remember, and all the significant digits, significant digits are all the certain digits plus the first uncertain digit. So when you take a measurement, the two, the four, the zero, zero in that case would be certain. It's just the six would be uncertain. It might fluctuate to a five, back up to a six, and you're like, ah, come on, settle down. Just like this, two, the 302 are all certain, but the one is uncertain. So it's always that last digit in a number. That's the uncertain digit. We'll talk about uncertainty uh, later, more for lab stuff. So the two, the four, and the six count, though both of those zeros are in between the four and the six. They're both captive zeros. They all count. So one, two, three, four, five. This would be five. Significant digits or significant figures. Easy peasy. Let's do trailing zeros. We'll be done with this. Let's do those trailing zeros, my friends. And again, this is where all the, the issues usually come from, at least what I've seen. Uh, so these are all zeros after the last non-zero digit. So find that last non-zero digit in the number provided. All zeros that come after that are trailing zeros. Now, do they count or not? Are they significant or not? Well, Look for the magic decimal point. So chemists utilize that decimal point as an arrow in our quiver to control, well, not control, to specify the uncertainty of a number. Um, uh, so we uh, decimal point, if it's used, makes all the trailing zero significant. Oh, it's not. It's, it's all or nothing, my friends. If there is no decimal point, none of them are. It is, we love the black and white here. It's all or nothing, right? So here's an example. And listen to the language that I use as a chemist. I love going to Las Vegas, one of my favorite places in the world, on top of Hawaii, yay! Um, or some lake where I can canoe around. It's nice and peaceful with blue herons, like, like in Minnesota or whatever. Land of 10,000 lakes, yay, Minnesota! But Vegas, that's just a hop, skip, and a jump. It's about 280 miles, you know, give or take from here where, where I live. Um, so, yeah, I can pop over there, you know, four hours-ish. Depends on, you know, how heavy your foot is. So if somebody says, well, how far is Vegas? Well, first thing you need to do as a chemist is specify your starting location and your ending location. Well, from my driveway to the parking lot of Treasure Island, right, or something like that. You got to be, because Las Vegas is pretty good. You got to be specific as a chemist. So if somebody says, how far is Vegas? Um, you need to specify also the units because some people might say, oh, it's about four hours. Well, okay, well, how many miles is Las Vegas from your driveway to the parking lot of Treasure Island? Welcome to how a chemist speaks. That way the person listening to you does not have to make any assumptions. It gets messy when people make assumptions like, you know, spacecraft crash on Mars because one person's using kilometers and one person's using miles. Oopsie, forgot to convert. $300 million booboo. Right, or imagine your engineer communicating with a scientist trying to make a sewer pipe or something like that. And one of them's using a flow rate of gallons per second and the other's liters per second, but they're thinking it and it's an assumption and nobody makes the conversion. So they make the pipe too small and it bursts underwater. Pretty crappy. 
Oh, okay, anyway, <laughs> it's just gotta, it's just gotta be dumb sometimes. All right, it makes life more enjoyable. So look at this phrasing. How far is Vegas? Eh, it's about 280 miles. You see, I'm not, I don't sound real certain, right? Eh, around 280-ish. You know, here as a chemist, we would go, if you look, if you watch the uncertainty video, that zero does not have a decimal, does it? So it doesn't count. So this is two significant figures, the two and eight. But I'm uncertain here. So do you see that eight's in the tens place? So this is plus or minus... 10 miles. So a chemist would look at this and go, yeah, 280, yeah, plus or minus 10. So it's probably anywhere from 270 to 200, between 270 and 290 miles. You know, best, best guess, 280. You see the uncertainty in that? So that only deserves two significant figures. But if, if you say, hey, how far is Vegas? 280 miles. Yeah, done that trip many times, 280 miles. They sound pretty certain, right? Eh, around 280, 280. You, you see the difference? So here we're going to put in what's called a naked decimal. There's nothing after it. Oh, usually only chemists care about that. But that naked decimal, you see the decimal point, makes that trailing zero significant. So this now becomes three significant figures. Since that is my last significant digits, that's my uncertain digit. This is plus or minus one mile. Right, the uncertainty is in the one place. So really, a chemist would go, yeah, two between two seventy nine and two hundred and eighty one miles. Pretty pretty certain about that. But then you get the science nerd like me, who you know had the old car and I had the od the the old analog uh, odometer, you know, with the little rotating thing, and I could go from my, you know, I could just reset it and go from my driveway and, blah, 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 and it's going click 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 and it goes to and right when i get to the treasure island parking lot it's 280.0 and i can kind of see the one there so it's it but it's more of a zero than a one so i'm not really certain about that but more zero showing than one so i'm gonna write 280.0 miles so says the science nerd that measured it on their odometer so if somebody asks science nerd like me how far is it Specifically, how many miles from your driveway to the treasure island? I would go two hundred and eighty point zero miles. I measured it on my odometer. Right? Get it? Get it? Get it? So, I'm pretty certain about that one. So that decimal point makes every single trailing zero significant. It doesn't matter if the zero is before or after it. That's irrelevant. I see a decimal point. So that zero and that zero count. So that's one, two, three, four significant figures. And now my last significant figure is in the tenths place. So this is plus or minus 0.1 miles. So really, when a scientist looks at that, they go, yeah, 279.9 to 280.1. That's kind of the range of the insert allowed uncertainty, you know, being very basic about it. Um, best shot, 280.0. So a, so a non-chemist non would go, well, those are all the same numbers. Technically, yes, they're the same value. But to a chemist, we go, no, nope, no, nope, that's a pea, uh, peanut, that's an acorn, and that's a large watermelon, right? Because the uncertainty is different. I could take all three of these numbers and do three calculations. Let's multiply all these by 241.6692 and round them to the proper uncertainty. We're going to get three different answers. So we're doing exactly the same calculation, but a chemist who tracks uncertainty will get three different answers. So that's key. So trailing zeros are a big, big arrow in the quiver of a chemist to be able to um, track the uncertainty of numerical values uh, with those trailing zeros. Now you can count them. Next video, we will look at tracking uncertainty throughout a series of mathematical operations. Right on, gang.